As you look about the sanctuary today, you will notice that it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. All four candles on the wreath are lit. Only the candle representing Christ is left to go. And then we have the tree and the wreaths on the windows. And we aren't singing hymns from the Christmas section of the book just yet, but we do have the two Advent hymns that are probably the most associated with Christmas. We're almost there. And our scripture readings reflect the fact too. Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin birth and then St. Matthew's application of that prophecy to the birth of Jesus. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, our gospel begins. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. But Christmas is not set up quite yet, just with the fact that Jesus has been conceived. That little group in the manger scene is still lacking one important member who has not yet been let in to what's going on in God's plan. The passive voice is interesting here. She was found to be with child. As we know from the Gospel of Luke, Mary herself knew right from the beginning that she was pregnant. An angel told her. And when she visited Elizabeth, still very early in the pregnancy, the infant John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb in recognition of this fact. And by this sign and the help of the Holy Spirit, his mother Elizabeth also knew who it was in Mary's womb. And I expect they told Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, who was also a prophet, or who at least prophesied upon the birth of his son, John. But if the virgin conception had not been revealed to you by an angel or by the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't have had any advanced knowledge of it. You would have to find it out the normal way as her belly began to swell. She was found to be with child. Now, actually, that's just the first part of the sentence. Our reading says she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. But the from the Holy Spirit part was not something that could be found out by simple observation. There was no soft glow about her belly or behind her head giving her a halo as she walked down the street. The angel Gabriel had not brought her heavenly documentation with God's name signed at the bottom. St. Matthew is just telling us in advance so that we will not think even for a moment reading his relation of the events that Jesus was simply a human child or that the Blessed Virgin Mary was unfaithful to her husband. It required revelation to know the identity of this child and the means of conception, the unique and miraculous means. And the circle of those who had been granted such revelation was still very small. Or so we must deduce, I think, from the fact that Joseph himself, Mary's fiancé, had not yet been let in. He, when, Mary, when Matthew's narration begins, has not yet had his vision. And seeing as he hadn't, how was Mary to tell him about this? That must have been a subject of fear and trepidation for her. I imagine it came up regularly in the months that she was staying with Elizabeth and Zechariah. How do I tell Joseph about this? What are the chances that he would believe? And I imagine Elizabeth might have said something to her such as, God revealed it to me at the right time so that I could help you for a little while. I expect he will reveal it to Joseph also so that he can help you for a much longer while. How Mary must have prayed that that would happen. But as of the time she returned to Nazareth to be found to be with child, the by the Holy Spirit part still remained stubbornly unobservable, and Joseph was still outside the loop. We wonder, did she try to tell him? Our first impulse would be, of course, she must have tried to tell him. Luke tells us she stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. And so when she returned to Nazareth, it's quite likely that the bump was small enough to conceal and she could have made it to Joseph ahead of the rumors. But that would only make her task marginally easier. I mean, imagine this excuse coming from the woman you're about to marry. An angel 
an angel told you this. The Messiah, he said. Mary, dear girl, you may be honest most of the time, but when you do lie, you go all out. I think maybe she didn't even try to tell Joseph, but just prayed, figuring out that if God revealed it to him the way he had revealed it to her, that's the only way he would believe it. But however it happened, whether she told Joseph and he didn't believe, or whether she just kept silent and praying that God would tell him, the situation at the beginning of our reading is that Joseph believes the worst. He believes that Mary has been unfaithful to him before they have even had a chance to begin living together as husband and wife. And he is planning to divorce her. Divorce, you might ask, but they're only engaged. Well, betrothal was a good sight more serious in the law of Moses than it is in our society today. If a betrothed girl was caught having an affair with someone other than her fiancé, it was treated just like adultery. The would-be bride and her lover both were served the death penalty. It was the same thing as marriage, except the two hadn't come together yet, as our text puts it. The Jews regarded it as basically the same as we would regard an unconsummated marriage today. I'm sorry, after you say I do, you really need a divorce, even if you haven't gone all the way yet. Once, and this approach to things isn't found just in the law of Moses. This approach to things, taking betrothal very seriously as a sort of marriage before the marriage, is something that you find in most of Western civilization also, and in other societies. Now we come to a statement I've always found very interesting in our text, and I hope you'll find it very interesting too, because the rest of the sermon is on it. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now why is that so interesting? We've explained the divorce part already. What makes it interesting is that Joseph here resolves to be merciful to Mary. He doesn't want to throw the book at her. He is unwilling to put her to shame. Or as the Greek would be more literally translated, he is unwilling that she should be made an example of. He may have feared for her life, actually, if he had brought this matter out in public and demanded his rights. Because that was the Mosaic penalty. Now the Jews were living under Roman law at this time, and they didn't have the right to just up and kill somebody. But that doesn't mean that it didn't ever happen. And she could have been subjected to other penalties or made an example of simply by making everything very public and unpleasant. Joseph is willing to take his dishonor, to take his loss, to take his bitter disappointment as privately as possible, to keep it out of the light, to not demand satisfaction. And that makes us like the guy, not only because we know what was really going on, but also because we're really hopeless romantics compared to most times and places in history. But we look back then at that interesting verse and say, it should say her husband Joseph being a kind man resolved to divorce her quietly, or her husband Joseph being a merciful man resolved to divorce her quietly, not a just man. I wouldn't think a just man would take such a gentle, forgiving approach. But that's what it says. Joseph was just. The Greek word is dikaios. Now, it can be translated righteous. So the easy way out would be to just translate it righteous and say, oh, okay, I expect an especially righteous man would choose kindness over strict justice. Because righteous means oh, you know, good and holy and does the right thing. And in this case, this would clearly be the right thing. That would be easy, but it wouldn't be honest with the word. We would be taking the word righteous, which apparently for us has a broader definition than just does, to also include ideas of mercy and love. We would be taking that and superimposing it back on the Greek word as if it doesn't mean primarily just. And in fact, what sense does it mean righteous in? 
Well, this began to change in Christian times, but the classical dictionary, the definition where it says righteous, the full definition is observant of duty to gods and men. Semicolon righteous. The righteous man is mindful of his duty. He is dutiful, which sounds an awful lot like just if you think about it. The just man pays attention to his duties, to his obligations, and he gives everyone what they deserve, and he expects them to be dutiful to him back. He decides cases according to impersonal principles of right and wrong instead of what he happens to be feeling at the moment. And what's another word for impersonal principles of right and wrong? Laws. We have a good translation here. Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolves to divorce her quietly. That's what the word means and makes us face what it means. So we have the same question. How does mercy flow from justice? What duty was Joseph fulfilling when he sought to show mercy to Mary? How could this be a decision motivated by a desire for fairness? To divorce her, that was simply to recognize the breach she had already caused. Whoever, or he, that he thought she had already caused. Whoever the father of that child is, you should go with him. Obviously, whatever you've been telling me, you don't mean it. He must be giving her he must be doing his duty to God rather than his duty to Mary, because he has no duty to Mary at this point. But didn't God give the law to Moses? Where should Joseph go to see what his duty to God is? Where else but the law of Moses, where it gives the death penalty? But he didn't say, hmm, that's a death penalty. We probably can't make that stick, blast those Romans but I can at least make it as unpleasant as I can. He didn't do that. And doubtless a lot of men from his generation would have, would have taken that tack and thought that they were in so doing, showing a very dutiful attitude toward God and his law. But God himself, through his inspiration of the Gospel of Matthew, is leading us to quite a different conclusion about what is the just thing to do in Joseph's situation. If Joseph had had the vocation of king or magistrate and had lived in an Israel where the law of Moses actually was the law of the land, perhaps he would have come to a different conclusion in contemplating his duty. But this obviously wasn't the case. What was Joseph's vocation in this case? What was his role in this little drama? As far as he knew, he was the victim. If any wrong had been done, he would have been the party that got wronged. What duty does the victim have? Does the victim have a duty? He doesn't have any punitive duty. He doesn't even have to divorce her, although he is entirely in his rights, and he was probably viewing it as a near call, a very close call. But what duty? Does he have a duty? Is it possible that he has a duty to show mercy? Could that be possible? We can't exactly quote the Mosaic law directly to that effect, thou shalt show mercy to the one that wrongeth thee, or anything like that. But it comes close when it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in the New Testament, that is the commandment that Jesus uses to summarize all the commandments that speak of our obligation to each other. And Jesus offers another summary of the law also. We know it as the golden rule. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. That speaks to reciprocity, to fairness. It is certainly a matter of duty, of justice, that you give to someone else what you need and expect from them yourself. And could it be that you have needed other people to forgive you in the past? And could it be that in the future you will also need other people to forgive you again? And if you stand in such need of forgiveness from your neighbor, 
Can you hear these summaries of the law and doubt that you are also beholden to extend him or her the same consideration? And remember also that Jesus teaches in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And in the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mercy is not intrinsically a part of justice. God, who does not stand in need of any reciprocal forgiveness, could have condemned us all to hell and still been just. For God, mercy is entirely a free expression of his love. But for any sinful man and woman, for anyone who needs mercy also from others and from God, it is part of justice to show mercy to others. We do not heroically go beyond what the law expects of us, even when we imitate the gospel. Even when we forgive each other even when we feel very heroic and self-sacrificing doing it. And this, I think, is how we ended up with the difference in English between our word just and our word righteous, because righteous embraces the Christian definition of the Greek word that is expanded by this realization and that includes mercy, whereas just allows us to talk specifically about the legal constraints and restrictions and aspects And they still mean basically the same thing, therefore, when applied to one of us. A just man, a righteous man, once we understand the relation of those words, we can call Joseph either one. But when we apply them to God, we see that they do mean something different. When we speak of God's justice, we do not mean to speak of his mercy and his forgiveness. We mean to speak of him as the incorruptible judge who will certainly punish the guilty and whose law is therefore to be feared and obeyed above all things. But when we speak of his righteousness, we remember also that he shows mercy, that he shows the forgiveness of sins through the life and death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Not because he had to, not because it was his duty as it is ours, but simply because he loved us and was not willing to put us to such shame and disgrace and punishment. And today we remember St. Joseph, the foster father of our Lord, who soon after that verse that we have spent all our time on did receive that revelation that he hoped for that must have come as an amazing relief to him, and who went on to be the human father, the, car the caretaker, the guardian of Jesus Christ, this son sent by God so that the difference between justice and righteousness could be seen in him. And before he was even born, while he was still in utero, the Lord, by his providence and his timing with Joseph's revelation, gave St. Joseph the occasion to show us a little example of what it was that he was about to do for the whole world through that child, the babe, the son of Mary. In the name of Jesus, amen.